Mark Jackson, Sixers pre- and post-game live. You saw him wrapping up the season this past week on Comcast Sportsnet Philadelphia. And really, Mark, you know, you look back at this season, 18-game improvement, those numbers there say a successful season, right? They said me, yes. You know, any progress is, is a good thing. And, uh, you know, the 76ers show killed incredible poise and they able to chip it down. They, they did a really good job with fighting, with, with competing, and really giving it their all. And I was really pleased, and I'm not going to lie, people say you should never tell me the outcome, but I like the progress that they had. So we like the progress that they had. We're – you know, you look at this season and you say, is it a tale of two seasons? Is it the Embiid part and then the post-Embiid part? I mean, it, it, it's frustrating because they they seemed in January that there was momentum to where playoff talk was starting to come up. And then, of course, they kind of fell out of the, the abyss to where you look up and say, they still have the fourth worst record in the league. So how much progress was there actually? It was progress. It was progress because, you know, they – they developed some players, uh, they, guys. I think they have solidified their guys who will be in a main rotation. I uh, mean, Dario Sarge, uh, Rocco, uh, they are definitely being a their rotation um, and ready to, to compete. You know, so I think it, it gave even TJ. I don't know if TJ is going to be around next year as a as a starter or backup. I doubt if he's going to start him, depending on what kind of moves they make. But he can. He has. With the amount of minutes he has, he has uh, got the last um, half, last fifty games of the season, he has been nothing but build his confidence and build his skill level as a player. So now he might be a viable backup for the Seventy Sixers. Uh, Mark Jackson's with us. Uh, I want to get your take, Mark, on the news that came out a couple of days ago regarding Ben Simmons. He's been okayed for full contact. We know he missed the full season, but he's been cleared for full contact drills. You had the same injury that Ben Simmons has had. Uh, obviously, this is really good news, uh, but did the Sixers play this whole thing right, and what can we expect to see from Ben Simmons now this summer uh, now that he's fully cleared? No excuses. That's 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 just like to see from, from the organization standpoint towards Ben. Let's get in the gym. Let's get this work in. Let's take it slow, but let's let's eventually get it going to full force. So we know we got in you coming the regular season. You know where he playing some league. I doubt it because I think it'll be overly cautious of him, Angel. Well, but I'll be honest. I would love to see him because he didn't miss the whole entire NBA season. And you know, some people say, oh, he needed some conditioning and just some pick up games and practice, he'll be fine. That is not the case. You know, if he doesn't play some of these, which most likely he won't, it'll be a harder transition into the regular season come November. You know, so but there but no matter what if he plays or he doesn't play in the summer league, they're gonna be working his tail off, getting him ready for that come season. Mark Jackson with us, there's a doctor's diagnosis and timetables and then media timetables, but really, Mark, since you had this injury, how long did it take you once you were cleared to really feel like that foot was back to normal? After I got fully cleared, after I had to just, you know, I did it, then broke it again and had surgery again, I would say after about the ninth week, maybe tenth week after I had it done again, I thought absolutely fine. I got my bounce back, got my speed back, and I really felt good, felt confident because it's going to be a mental hurdle. But, you know, you know, to get over because once you get injured and you go through the recovery process, the recovery process of the actual injury is one thing, but the mental side is a whole different animal. And, you know, that's something. But, you know, what we're talking about Ben Simmons who's been doing, you know, some incredible dunks before the games. So I'm quite sure he'll be okay mentally um, when it's time for him to go 100%. Yeah, I saw the thing last night where he played the one-on-one -on -one with a young kid and he blocked his shot and then threw the ball like 30 yards, 30 rows up. And I just thought that was a hilarious video. So it's not like it looks like he's moping and draining and, and uh, he's depressed about it. You think the foot will hinder him at all moving forward, especially playing point guard? And that's where Brett Brown's indicated a couple times he wants to use him as a point. You know, that foot cutting, defending, stuff like that. You know, I'm still a little sick scratching my head on putting Ben at the point. Okay, I can see him seeing the main um, facilitator on the team, but him being labeled the point guard where he's the AKA Magic Johnson, running the plays, running the point. You know, I don't know. Ben, Ben's a big guy. Ben's not a Ben is not a small guy. Ben's about two thirty, and he said he's lost him now. He's about two thirty, and he's about six six eleven, six eleven and a half now. 
I'll be worrisome having him on that perimeter, bringing the ball up, being a the bona fide 100% point guard, because I think it's just putting more stress on his foot than maybe we would like to see. But Ben is an excellent player um, coming out of LSU, even from his accolades in high school. I don't, I don't think he should have any more problems because I think the Southern State is overly precautious and really making sure they didn't rush anything. But if something was to come about at that foot again, that would be a major setback because they was very, very, very cautious in the, the, um, the healing process with them. So I think that's something that's not even in their minds that, oh, just in case something happens again. I think they're going into this all season. believe we gave them extra rest. We let them sit out the year every, all overly cautious. You know, I think he's 100 percent let's push him now. Yeah, you know, uh, cutting and, and changing directions for a guy 6'10", 230 pounds on a, uh, a foot that – you have mentioned, Mark, has a really high rate of re-breaking. So that's where you, you wonder if um, him changing directions and doing everything with that big frame, are we just inevitably going to see something else wrong with that foot? I hope not. But, you know, here's the thing. Once they put the screw in, the foot is stronger than it was before the surgery. But when you're favoring something, you always tend to maybe hinder or hurt something else, like a hamstring, a calf, um, the Achilles or the other foot. That's something to maybe keep your eye, eye out for and maybe be able to cost his own and make sure he is 100% and make sure they take the process slowly when they get him back to speed. Because I would hate for him to be jumping right into everything and they go a little bit too, ha- too fast, too soon, and other things start twerking, tweaking. Mark, uh, Jared Bayless spoke today, and I thought his comments were kind of interesting you know, about his role. I mean, he, he only got to see him a handful of games. Uh, he played pretty well in the three games, really two games, that he played. And I really think that, you know, they envision him this year being a lot bigger. Those two guys together playing a lot more together. Do you like Jared Bayless and Ben Simmons sharing that backcourt together moving forward? I do. Because I think um, Bellis can play on the ball or off the ball. Right. Um, not last, not this season, but last year he had a career high in three point shooting. And he needs to put shooters around Ben and Joel and B because those guys are command double teams. Um, and people have to help off uh, players. So you need players around that can hit that three or that long ball to space the floor. So Bellis can do that. He can also be the point. Um, we all know Ben's going after every rebound. If he gets it, no one's going to stand in front of him. He's like he's, he's LeBron S. As far as being a freight train going downhill when he gets that reball, a rebound, he's going coast to coast. So at a half court set, when the bit is trying to run the point, he's coming off screens on the strong side, and people are helping off that weak side. Bell, uh, uh, Bellis is a player that is notoriously known for knocking down that shot, and he's an adequate defender. Spending a few minutes here with Mark Jackson, Sixers pre and post, and Mark Joel Embiid has said that his knee injury that required surgery wasn't as severe as initially diagnosed. Do you want to see him play any summer league? Do you think he'll be on a minute restriction next season? Well, I don't think Ben is going to – I don't think there's no way in the world that he will pay, play at all during the um, summer league. Um, I think they were first working him out. But we've heard that before, all oh, the injury's not as bad as it is. Or the healing process may be, may be worse than the actual injury was, the initial injury. So we have to wait to see how he recovers from that. Uh, but I, I doubt if we'll see him at uh, playing any summer league games because he's proven himself to be so viable and a bona fide superstar in this league. Bona fide, as you know, in my opinion, a bona fide all star. Um, but about expected, yes, yeah, I do believe uh, Wall and B will come into next season and Ben Simmons with minute restrictions. Maybe not playing back to backs. I do see the similar pattern from this past season happen, because look, they did it this year and he still got hurt. So I don't, I can't see them unleashing him playing 38 minutes every game when they had him on minutes restriction this year and he kept getting Nick, um, nicks and bruises. I see him being on minutes restriction and not playing back to backs. And then maybe start off that way with eventually those those two things being lifted. But as of now, I see both of them coming in the season with the minutes restriction. Mark, how do you see uh, Dario? Is he best suited for a roll off the bench? Uh, do you see him as a fit with a Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons dominated offense? I think he'd come off the bench next year. I think they'll start Ben at the four, even though Coach Sainz at the point. I think they'll start Ben at the four 
uh, Joel at the five, uh, Rocco at the three. Um, Bell is somewhere that, and then they'll be trying to get another guard from the draft. I mean, from the draft, or maybe make some trades with them, uh, the draft picks they have to bring another guard in. That's the ultimate lineup for them with, with Ben, uh, Dario being the first person off the bench. Um, and with Dario coming in as instant offense, that's another playmaker that has eyes behind his ear, his head, similar to a Ben Simmons, who we all know is a much better shooter than Ben is right now. And he can do nothing but help this franchise and help what they're trying to do with this organization, the path they're trying to go. Because you ask to play Joel and B, Ben Simmons, and Dario together as far as, as far a moment. But I don't think you play 30 minutes that way. I think you play 10, 15 minutes that way during the course of a game. But I see Dario coming off the bench, and I actually see him being an instant offense for this team. Clark, you mentioned draft picks. If they get that Laker pick and then end up with two first-rounders, do you move a pick for a younger veteran player, or do you draft two young players? That's a great question. Everybody say, oh, draft young and develop them. Yeah, but that's not a guaranteed process. That's not a guaranteed thing where that guy's going to actually pan out. But if you can package those two draft picks for the likes of a Paul George, a Jimmy Butler, uh, uh, getting a um, getting a a uh, signing a uh, JJ Redick from the Clippers, I mean you got to take that. You got to have better leadership, having a locker room, a bona fide player who's proven himself in his league. I think he can do nothing but help this team. And I'm gonna answer the limit here. I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but a veteran such as say hypothetically say a Paul George, I think Paul George is coming to this organization. And not just help him for his points, rebounds, and assists, two we player. I forget that. But I think Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons had a little bit too easy this year sitting out, not being on the bench some games, being on the bench some games, not being at the, the, the game sometimes, being in L.A. sometimes. I think Paul George, who's an Olympian, an all-star, a bona fide superstar in the face of a franchise, can come in there and teach those young guys how to be professional. Because I really believe, Deep down, that those guys got away with a little bit this year that they wouldn't have been able to get away in any other program assisting uh, in the NBA. And I think some of better leadership can help show these guys, somebody who respects, somebody who's a proven, a proven player in this league, can help teach them how to be professional. Now, that's an interesting point. Now, Ben Simmons had said in the video that he posted the other night when he said that he's got the clean bill of health, in that video, he said that he gained a lot by sitting out the year. You know, a lot of times we're disappointed that we don't see them, but do you think there is a lot of benefit to these young players sitting and just watching an NBA season and actually not playing in any of the games? I do. Because when you're sitting, you're watching. If you're watching videotapes, you're learning a game from the pros. From, you're learning from watching a game right there in the court. Guys, young guys now, they may be watched. The ones who want to be NBA stars in college, they maybe watch one game a day or every other day. But when you're watching practice, you're learning, you're hearing what the coach is teaching. You're seeing the plays. You're seeing the speed of the game. You're seeing LeBron. You're seeing Kevin Durant. You're seeing Carmelo. You're seeing these guys that you're going to be guarding. You're watching them. You get to see them that close and see what's the game plan for them because you can hear what your coach saying, this is the game plan for LeBron today. See if it works. If it don't work, you put that in your mineral index. Well, yeah, that didn't work. So I, so I know not to try that when I'm guarding next year. You can learn. You can sit. You can learn. You can be patient. You know, you can not make a mistake. And sometimes it's best to think about things. I wonder if I do that. Watch somebody do it on the court and see if it's, it succeeded or it failed and learn from that. So, yes, they can. It's similar to a quarterback in the NFL a lot of people say if you sit and sit back and be patient and sit and learn first, you can learn more that way. And I see it that way. Hey, Mark, you said uh, you brought up Paul George's name. Will Paul George and Gerald Henderson have to kiss and make up if he comes here? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they can be on the same team. That that seemed like that was deep rooted. That, that <laughs> to me, I think that was deep rooted with Paul George and Gerald. Like they might have had some history because that that wasn't. That was, that was a personal. That was a personal tooth, but it was just been going at a band a little bit. Maybe that's where it came from. But I don't know. Paul George, I love Gerald. He's a, he's a Pennsylvania guy. But if we can get Paul George in there, man, I'll, they can take <laughs> right. the whole backcourt. 
Yeah. Episcopal Academy uh, notwithstanding. Uh, Mark yes. would be at Mark Paul would be George, giving him a, a nice George, handshake. George. Thank you for your service. Right, right. Nice to see you. Hey, uh, Mark, <laughs> what did you think Coach Brown did? Uh, the job that he did this year, Brett Brown. How do you think he did? I think he. I thought Coach Brown did an excellent job, but given the cards he was dealt, you know, you didn't know who was going to be in line up. You didn't know who was going to be the lineup. You didn't know who had the green light, red light, yellow light. You didn't know those things. So with the, with the season he had. Coaching his team that was banged up, not knowing who he could play him. I thought it was great for him. I thought it was also great to help him with develop his coaching, learn to play more, to do more with less. You know, I think that can always help a coach. So when you get more talent, it helps you because you learn when you have players that maybe not at the same skill level. Mark Jackson's with us, of course, uh, former Sixers, Sixers pre- and post-game live on uh, Comcast Sportsnet Philadelphia, the Sixers end their season with uh, 28 wins. Uh, very interesting offseason, Mark, for Brian Colangelo right now. This is almost um, he gets put into a situation where he's got, you know, draft choices, a lot of money. What would you like to see from Colangelo? What is one thing you would like to see Brian Colangelo pursue this offseason? I don't really like to see him not necessarily build from the draft. I would like to see the 76 get very blessed and fortunate to get two first-round picks that we all got our fingers crossed. I would like to see him develop this team from veteran leadership and players that can play. Not necessarily bring them into the locker room, guys, but they most likely can't contribute on the court. I would like to see them bring in a dual player, a dual meaning they can give you some numbers on the court and they can give you some leadership off the court. I would like to see, I would like to see if Colangelo do that instead of trying to build and get younger from the draft. They're already, I believe, the second youngest team other than Phoenix, maybe the first. And so that's all I like to see Colangelo do. What can he do with this roster? Now with the new CBA, it's, it's nearly impossible to grab a superstar from an organization because they've been giving up so much money um, leaving that team with uh, their bird rights. But I think, you know, with some trades, you know, I, I think you can use those trades to get guys that may be already under contract for a good number of years and build their trust. And, and they, they bring them here and say, look, Shows up that you're trying to build a winner to compete for a championship. So I would like to see Colangelo do that. Yeah, kind of the feeling of look, you've got a lot of you've got enough young talent. It's time to maybe find that uh, that final piece to build around the young talent you already have instead of backloading more young talent to you know where the growing pains is. Because let me ask you this, Mark, before I get your opinion on some of these NBA playoff games um, series, I should say, but. Do you think that next season that the, the playoffs or the you know a 35 40 45 win season is a must? I do. Um I wanted a record last night saying what's my prediction? That's the 76 is being between a 38 and 42 um ball game. Uh a twin team competing for that eighth position in the playoff. I really do. I look at it like this. If you say if it wasn't on draft this year, you just have to use what you have on your roster. So if the 76ers can get everyone healthy, mm -hmm. which is far stretch, everyone healthy, get them healthy enough, they don't have to be a minute's restriction, I think this year, without draft, they would be able to compete for that eighth position. So imagine they could do it. They, they use those picks or leverage those picks to get some better leadership, some more basketball players. They could do nothing but go up. I think the 76ers fans, what happened in January, can look forward to a situation like that with them going on rolls like that. Where it can maybe get come out a, a month, a season, get eight wins in a month, ten months, uh, ten wins in a month. I think that's a realistic goal for them. Uh, I, I I like what you said there too. That if they have Ben and they have Joel this whole season, we're wondering if uh, I'm about to ask you about their playoff matchup, like I will right now about some of these. Mark Jackson, uh, Milwaukee, Toronto. Your thoughts on that one? Listen, the Greek freak is special. He's a special talent. I wasn't working the game um, last Saturday, but I went to sit, and I'm sitting for out watching a Greek freak. First of all, he's gotten like four inches taller since his rookie year. I know that for a fact because I remember his rookie year. He was nowhere near the, the, the height he is now, the lefty he is now. He's a problem. That team is playing pretty good under Jason Kidd. But let me tell you something. Toronto Raptors, with the addition of Ibaka, is just a whole nother team. I think they're so that people sleep. In my opinion, I think people are truly sleeping on them. I think they can do some major damage in playoff. Unfortunately, that means Milwaukee has a run into first. Toronto, if Kyle Lowry's healthy, 
They got the uh, uh, the uh, They I think their team is just built for the playoff. They got depth now. They got leadership. They got defense. They got offense. They they got mid range guys. I, they had great coaching. I really think they're built to do some serious damage in the Eastern Conference. Mm, all right, uh, juicy stuff there. Washington, Atlanta, the four five. I think Atlanta's in trouble. I think Atlanta's in trouble. I think John Wall and Bell, I feel, is going to go in there and they're going to do work. I think, you know, they keep claiming themselves the best backcourt in the NBA. I wouldn't go that far, but they're definitely top three. Listen, those two gentlemen are going to really get it going in Atlanta, and Atlanta's going to have some problems trying to contain contain those guys. I really think those guys get it going, and I see Washington getting out of there maybe in, in five games. Okay, the other two on the west side, Houston, Harden versus Oklahoma City, Westbrook. What a first-round matchup that is. All I'm going to say about that is get my popcorn ready <laughs> and pull up my chair and tell my children to get a chair sitting next to me because we've been watching any favorite basketball. The two top number one, um, number one, number two MVP guys going at it in the first round. I mean, that's a travesty for these two guys to meet in the first round. But if you're Adam Silver, you got to say, this is going to do great for our ratings because – the eyes on that series is going to be incredible. Uh, and the other one that's pretty intriguing, you got the flashy lights of L.A. against Salt Lake City, Utah. You couldn't have two more different cities there, huh? Two more different cities, but also I'm going – I'm believing that. I said this, you said it was crazy. I'm having a feeling Utah is going to put an end of the Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan era in Los Angeles. Los Angeles, I think Utah is – First of all, nobody watches Utah because it's Utah, but <laughs> they get no they get no no height, no puff. But their defense, they definitely have shooters. They have they, they, man, they have they have the big guy in the middle. I think Utah is going to squeak out that series and win it. And I see some changes being made in the Clippers organization. All right, uh, there are some of the uh, more intriguing playoff matchups. Mark Jackson, you said by the way, one and two. Who's your MVP? Who's one? Who's two? I got to go with Westbrook. I think Westbrook has did something special. Now, I'm going by dumb and the MVPs because the one and two because of the way the MVP voting goes. So, I still think by far LeBron James is the greatest basketball player on the planet. I don't think no one comes close. So, but the way it's going, I got it for the triple doubles. People saying yes to his numbers, but Oklahoma City is a good team, but they're not a great team. But they got one thing that's great. They have a great player, and that's Russell Westbrook. And his ability to be to keep this team afloat and do the things they're doing is mainly because of his prowess and his prolific scoring and his rebounding and his assisting is just tremendous. So I like it. I think Russell Westbrook is going to be James Harden finishes close second. To be honest, I wouldn't mind if they get co MVPs. Could be the way they go there with those two. It seems like there's such debate on them. Mark Jackson, Sixers pre and post game live as the Sixers end their season at 28 and 54. They have the fourth best shot at the number one overall pick in the draft. And Mark, we'll talk plenty draft and playoffs with you down the road, pal. Uh, we enjoyed it as always. I appreciate you guys. It's always fun.